my name is Preet and I am a physiotherapist in the army. I love pretty much anything outdoors, trying new things and challenging myself. I played tennis full time as a teenager, uh, which then transitioned into running, just half marathons to start with. And then this transitioned into ultra marathons and then on to different endurance events, which I'm sure I'll talk about. And now I'm training to do a solo expedition in Antarctica. So at the moment, I'm based in between Preston and London. So a nice geographical spread there. So in London, I'm doing some clinical work and Preston is where my, my army unit is based. And did you always want to go into the army? No, no, not at all. So I saw a, an advert in the city centre in Derby, uh, which is where I'm from. I basically thought that looks interesting. And I didn't tell anybody that I was going to join because um, I knew that people would try and stop me at the time. So I just, uh, yeah, I, I basically signed on the dotted line, thought that it sounded like a cool thing to do. Saw all the pictures of people doing adventurous training. And here I am, like, what, 12 years later. <laughs> Oh my God, what did your parents say when you told them that you'd signed up for the army? Yeah, not happy at first, as it's something very out of the norm and something they didn't know much about. But now they see, you know, how well I'm doing and and now they're quite proud of me. Let's talk a little bit more about your early years. So you said that you played tennis. Tell us a little bit more about you were playing tennis full time. Is that correct? So I grew up in Derby and at the start, life was um, pretty normal. I just went to the school opposite the house. I wasn't really involved in tennis until I was about 10, which is when me and both my older brother started playing. We started playing quite regularly. And then I moved away from home when I was 14 to play at Sutton Tennis Academy, which is when I started attending school just part time. So I left school with just a few GCSEs as I only took a few. And that's when I moved to Czech Republic to play full time when I was 19. So probably a different or unique upbringing, I would say. So I was away from home most of the time, really, from the age of 14. Got quite used to being independent. I was always meeting new people. I felt comfortable striking up a conversation with anyone I met. And even from a young age, I was planning logistics of how I would get to a tournament in in another country, book accommodation, etc. on my own. And in Sutton, I was playing, you know, I was kind of on a regular training program. So I was splitting my time in between tennis and GCSEs. Then in Czech Republic, I was playing full time. And at the age of 19, I realized that it's not what I wanted to do anymore. I wasn't really enjoying it at all. And I didn't have much education behind me. And it's funny, at 19, to me, I felt like I was really behind everybody else my age. I thought I have minimal GCSEs, I had no A-levels, and I didn't really know what direction my life was going in. So I think I felt a bit worried as well. So when I got back to England, I lived back in Derby for about a year, and I worked really hard to, as I would have put it at the time, to get my life on track because there's me at 19 thinking I'm super behind everyone else. So I got into an access course. I started volunteering at the local hospital, got myself a job at Burger King, joined the Army Reserve. So I saw the advert and I got onto um, my university degree to do physiotherapy, which was a huge achievement for me at the time and actually still one of my biggest achievements to date. At 19, you know, you're moving back to England, you're pursuing this different path, you've decided you need to, to get your life back on track almost, and actually you felt you were feeling quite far behind sort of your peers and, you know, wanting to go back into education. When you were having to make all these decisions about leaving tennis, what you were going to do, what, you know, going back to, to college, going to university, how were you making those decisions? Did you have a mentor were you speaking with friends was it speaking with family was it more independent you know how how did you decide what you wanted to do I think I just got involved in anything I could and you know then I met mentors along the way so joining the army reserves was great for me I was in a reserve unit in Derby where I met you know a lot of incredible people who really helped me even during my access course because So I was 19 on this access course. It was myself and another chap who was my age. And then most of the people were uh, returning to education in their 30s or their 40s. And I felt quite nervous about doing things like biology and just going back to that education life. I was very nervous about going to university, actually, and felt very far behind people that had done their A-levels. And then in terms of 
everything else that I chose to do. I, I just got advice from different people. I thought I want to give myself the best chance possible of getting into uni. So I emailed so many people. I um, went on the UCAS website and every university I could find that did physio, I would email the admin and ask exactly what calls I needed, what might help my application, spoke to other people that were physios that, you know, said this might benefit you, that might benefit you. And my aim was just to do as much of that as possible. Did you have many role models, like female role models at that age or women that you looked up to who inspired you? To be honest, there wasn't really anyone at the time in terms of female role model that I was looking up to. You know, I admired certain tennis players, so I uh, loved Steffi Graf, but there wasn't anyone um, that I, I thought, yeah, that's somebody that I want to be like. Or I, and then I met people along the way, though. So, for example, I remember one of my university lecturers and, you know, I saw what they were doing and I thought, wow, that'd be amazing to, to be able to do that. Or I looked at somebody that had a master's and thought, wow, you know, it'd be incredible if I could do that. And then it's great because then you reach those stages. So I'm doing my master's at the moment. And, I, and it's funny because I still don't feel very academic. But when my um, when my niece was born, so my niece is nine, I almost, in a way, I see her as an inspiration because I want her to grow up without these barriers and without these boundaries that I think we either create for ourselves or other people put there for us. Not, not on purpose, but because you're doing something that is out of your comfort zone and probably out of their comfort zone too. So that becomes scary. I'd love to talk to you more about your running. So you said, you, you know, you started with a traditional sort of half marathon and then that sort of progressed and then you ended up doing ultra marathons. Tell us more about what you love about running. I always ran a little bit, probably from the age of kind of 10, 11, 12, probably when I started playing tennis, you know, it's a part of training. And I've always been quite tall. So I always did okay in um, in school events. I didn't really do more than that until I started university. And I think somebody just said to me, you know, why not try running a half marathon? And I did. And, um, you know, it was it was great. I enjoyed it. It was really good fun. And then I did a few more. So then I thought, okay, I can do a half marathon. Why not try a full marathon? And I did a few marathons. Again, great. You know, I love the London Marathon. It just, the atmosphere of people on the way around was just incredible. And it's, I I love things like that. I love that there's, you know, so many people there with you. You're not, you're not alone. And then after I'd done full marathon, I just, I wanted something more. So, you know, I threw out the idea of doing an ultra marathon. And I remember looking up a finding this ultra marathon, which was called Dust Till Dawn which is 50 miles in the Peak District and overnight as well. So I rocked up with my backpack, which was way too big. I had basically like a picnic in my bag that had like, you know, sandwiches, etc. And, and lots of treats. And I remember seeing all these other people with their like, you know, ultra, ultra kind of small bags and they look like real ultra runners. Anyway, I um, I did the race. There was, I can't remember what the guy was dressed as, but the cutoff person, so he couldn't pass you basically was dressed as a Grim Reaper, I think, because it was around Halloween time. But luckily, I kept, I kept ahead of him. And I was one of the last people in. And it took, you know, I came, kind of came in while it was, when it was light again. And it took me over 12 hours. It was absolutely one of the most challenging things I'd ever done at the time. And it was fantastic, though. I, I was sick at the end. I hadn't booked accommodation there so then had to sleep in the car for a few hours before going home but everything about it was brilliant because you know it doesn't matter that it was tough while you were doing it it doesn't matter that I was the last person in it doesn't matter that I was wholly unprepared I still did it and I was like great I've done this and it was funny the next week I was working in the NHS at the time as a physio and my colleagues gave me some crutches to get to get to the other side of the hospital uh, just because I was kind of hobbling quite a lot But I'd already caught the bug. I was like, if I can do that, you know, what else can I do? So then I did a a few more ultramarathons. And, you know, when people say, oh, wow, that sounds incredible. I'm like, I'm not. It was hard to say, actually, yeah, I'm I'm an endurance runner. I'm like, well, no, I just, you know, I just do it. It's, you know, it's, it's a mixture of walking and running. It's a great thing to try. And then, yeah, like I said, I did a few more. And I remember for Secret Santa one year, someone bought me a book that said, like kind of 100 of the world's toughest challenges or something along those lines. American Disciples was in it. And that was the first I'd heard of that race. And, you know, again, you read something, you're like, wow, that sounds incredible. That sounds like, you know, super, super tough. And a few years went on and I was like, well, you know, why not, why not enter? 
So I entered and, you know, I had a plan. Obviously, I would train for the year, etc. Then I ended up going on tour to South Sudan for six months. And uh, we were on quite a small camp. Towards the end of the tour, I did organize a 30-hour endurance event, which helped me in my training as well. But I did 12 hours on two camps and six hours on another camp. And even the 12 hours, I don't know how many laps we did of the camp. It was a lot. I think it was a two-mile radius um, all the way around. So other than that one event, I hadn't really been training for running. I'd done a lot of gym training. I've definitely gotten stronger. And then I got back to England, but I had uh, a little bit of leave because I've been away for six months. So I was like, yeah, I need to train, but I want to use this opportunity to travel. So then I went to South America and uh, did a little bit of traveling and uh, sprained my ankle kind of on um, on one of the, the mountains in Brazil as I was going up. So yeah, strapped that up, carried on with like my holiday, basically. Went to Brazil, went to Bolivia, did a little bit more kind of walking up hills. Uh, well, Bolivia, everywhere's a hill. <laughs> and then I went to uh, Peru, which I absolutely loved. Anyway, I came, came back to England and a little bit panicked because now it's about a week to 10 days before I have to be at the airport for this race. So I um, then... Uh, got the right trainers that I needed to get, went to a chap um, in Clapham who uh, gets the Velcro attached to trainers. Uh, and he was great like at turning that around quite quickly. And I remember nervously asking him, has anyone else come to you this late? <laughs> and he said, there's a few people. Anyway, I ordered all my food or the kit that I needed. Obviously rocked up uh, at the airport and met, met other people who were, uh, were going on this event. Uh, so I, I entered on my own, but like with anything, you're never on your own. I think when I did the race, probably just one one or two stretches where I couldn't see people and they were on the long days. Other than that, you know, you're always kind of meeting people, which is fantastic. Anyway, got to the to the start line and the first day was pretty hard. I, I think it was about a half marathon, but I just hadn't run a half marathon in a while. So it was it was quite challenging. And then like with anything, I think I get used to things. So it was still difficult, but I knew that mentally I could get through it. And I did. And, you know, it was great. It was, um, I still keep in touch with the, the people that I shared the tent with. We had, you know, a great, great group of people. And yeah, and I completed it. It was after that, or well, actually it was before that, I thought I wanted to do a big endurance challenge, but I hadn't quite decided what it was. And it was after I'd done the race, I was like, right, now I need to start prepping and planning for this big endurance challenge that I want to do. One of the things that, you know, you talked about is is the mental side of the challenge and mental resilience, and mental grit, mental determination is such a key part of, of physical challenges that you take on. And I'd love to know more about your mindset, your mental resilience. What are your tips and tricks? How has that developed over the years? Has that come from, you know, from army training, from your, you know, your personal experiences? Talk to us a little bit more about you know, your mental resilience? I think with anything, you do have to train it and, you know, it grows with time. So when I was 19 and and joined the join the army um you know going on exercise was a huge challenge for me um you know as time went on just doing things like basically shoveling for hours and then you know basically sleeping (laughs) sleeping in that hole that you've dug was a huge challenge and every time I've overcome or you know done one of those weekends or you know that I joined the regular army and did a little bit more and more I feel as though I've become more and more mentally resilient. So the more you do, the more you realize you're capable of, you know, and that goes for every run I've ever done. You know, I'm training for a polar expedition. I never, ever would have thought that would be something I would do. Yet here I am now training for it. And in terms of how you can train for it, I think even when I used to play tennis, people would always say, oh, you're always happy on court. Even if you're losing, you you know, you're always happy. And I think I don't think I was, to be honest, the best tennis player at all. I think a lot of the time I used to win just because the other person had given me the points because, you know, they were mentally down at points rather than me physically being a better tennis player than them. And for me, it was about leaving the last point behind. That's done now. So let's say you've had a bad day. That's done. There's nothing I can do about it now. So let's move on to the next day. You can't control the external factors. So when I was in Greenland, you know, some of the days were really tough. There was five days where we were basically in a snowstorm and, you know, kind of stuck in the tent and we were leaving the tent every two to three hours, digging and burying the tent from the snow, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, horrific 
weather it really was it's the worst I've ever like experienced and I was getting out on my hands and my knees and feeling because my goggles would fog or freeze up within seconds and then just on my knees shoveling for like two hours and then get, getting back in into the vestibule area like my toes and my fingers were just so cold and even just trying to un- unzip my jacket took like 10-15 minutes and and that frustration um, you get at that point can really get you down and you know we weren't really sleeping and then everything in the tent had gotten quite wet and damp we were rationing fuel at that stage you know a combination of factors basically which was very mentally challenging but then the way I looked at it was okay I can't control these external factors I can't control the weather I can't control any of those things that are happening what I can control are the internal factors I can control how I deal with it now I am um, used to do so I'm flipping from stories that I am um, I've always done quite a lot of traveling and I've always been quite impulsive actually on, on some of the trips that I do and what I used to do was call my friends and um, so you know two in the morning sometimes I'll be traveling somewhere and I'll message one of my friends and some someone's up and I'd call them and that would help me and um, that would help that kind of you know me well, from a mental health point of view really it helped me to talk about it but then what do you do when you you can't talk to anybody about it you can write it down So, you know, I would write things down in my diary uh, about how I was feeling. And then, you know, I love a motivational quote. So (laughs) sometimes I'd give myself a little quote or have a few in there to kind of motivate myself. So I think just people cope with it in different ways. And actually, I'm looking into doing some, um, some meditation as well, but I haven't started that at the moment. So for now, I concentrate on the internal factors. And sometimes I take five deep breaths. I just write in my diary and I'm like, okay, the next day is a new day. Concentrating on what happened yesterday is not going to help me. You know, there is absolutely no benefit to that whatsoever. And you don't want to be mentally drained. That, you know, will hugely affect your physical performance and you know that could be in any forms of life you know not just sports so you know my experience is yet tennis whether it's running you know even with my masters as well okay I didn't do so well on that module that week fair enough okay let's concentrate on the next one tell us a little bit more about your dream to go to Antarctica where did this come from good question so I just wanted to do something completely out of the norm for me um so I knew I wanted to do a challenge for ages to push myself I just didn't know what it was going to be and my old boss Cam Khan is the first person that I think mentioned Antarctica to me but when he mentioned it it didn't really clock at the time because I was like oh you know I'd been Nordic skiing once and I wasn't very good so I didn't really think that was an option for me and then it obviously came into my uh my head again like a year or two later and I started doing some research on it so just on google you know like how would you get to the south pole started reading some blogs and hearing what other people had done and I was like okay this might be something that I want to try so I remember getting hold of um, Lewis Rudd's number who's done some you know amazing polar expeditions and it's a great polar explorer and I had his number for about a month before contacting him or maybe two months even because I thought to myself I didn't have any experience or anything to go on and what I'm saying I want to do I want to do a solo I knew I wanted to do something on my own a solo expedition in Antarctica it sounds kind of crazy and I didn't want to go to somebody who's loads of polar experience and just be like this is what I want to do anyway eventually I did call him and you know he was really helpful basically uh, about telling me what experience I would need and you know where would be a good place to start so that's what I did I Actually, before I called him, I was filling out the um, application through Antarctic Logistics Expedition, which just talks about some of the experience you have. And I really didn't have any winter experience. And one of the questions on there was, have you ever been on a glacier or been ice climbing, which I hadn't. So then I was uh, looking where, where I could go in Europe over summer leave to do those things. So um, Iceland. OK, so I um, I always seem to do things last minute. So I, <laughs> I booked my uh, my flights to Iceland hired a car found somewhere that I could I could go glacier hiking basically and uh, and ice climbing so book, booked a guy to take me and off I went I remember flying into Iceland and uh, going in store and I rented a uh, blanket out was it a blanket I rented something out maybe it was a sleeping bag the guy at the store was like oh it's going to be cold if you're sleeping in the car and I was sleeping in the car and gave me like an extra blanket bless him and I drove along the coast I did some glacier hiking, slept in the car, drove further along the coast, um, did some ice climbing. 
uh, and then slept in the car. Uh, so I did that for about three days before I came back to England. And I was like, right, OK, now I've done some kind of, you know, winter training. I've been ice climbing. I've been on a glacier and I felt more prepared to fill the application out. And none of that is, you know, that difficult to arrange. It's not polar specific. Um, however, you know, there's loads of crossover skills and it's still winter training. So after that, I booked on to a polar training course and did some more specific polar training. And, you know, it's similar to the running. The more I did, the, the dream became achievable. So, yes, any idea sounds crazy at the start. What qualifies me to be able to do a 700 mile solo unsupported expedition in Antarctica? It doesn't really matter where you start. So I had been Nordic skiing in 2016. So I was a physio with the Royal Signals on um, on their Nordic ski uh, camp, which was brilliant. And so that was the first time I tried it. Now, I was terrible. I was on my ass most of the time, to be honest. But all those skills count, basically. And everything you do, you realise how much crossover there is between it, or the kind of mental resilience I've built up through the army or being away when I was younger, all has helped towards my training now. One of the first things that I normally think about is I think about the money. How much is this going to cost me? How can I how can I afford to pay for this? Antarctica and polar stuff, it's not cheap. Just, you know, even the equipment, you know, to get the technical equipment that you need, which is lightweight, it's going to keep you warm. Plus, you know, doing the practice expeditions, getting yourself out there. How much is this going to cost you? And how are you paying for your training and your trip to Antarctica? It is very expensive. So I, to start with, I didn't really keep a checklist of how much it was going to cost. And I think that's just because I I wasn't really sure in terms of the training that I was going to do. So I just took one bit at a time, really. So for example, when I did the polar training course in Finster, which was a great course and gave me, to be honest, gave me the baseline of what I needed. I basically paid it in installments and paid uh, some of it on my credit card as well uh, because I was paying for the first semester at my master's at the time and then the more expensive trip Greenland I paid for in installments it took me about six months to pay off my credit card so it is expensive yes but you know in my eyes if you want something bad enough you put everything you have into it and it's and it's hard it's not easy you know a lot of people at the time a lot of uh, people I knew my friends were using their savings for house deposits and there's me using all of my savings to do this Greenland expedition but that trip gave me a lot it really did give me a lot so in terms of the expedition itself so there's a certain amount that will go to Antarctic logistics expeditions who basically will sort out everything for me once I arrive in Antarctica so all the logistics, all the fuel, etc. And then in terms of how I've paid for training and everything else, it's been a mixture from my savings. I started a GoFundMe account. And to be honest, I've had so many people help me with kit. When I went to Greenland, I borrowed kit from Lewis Rudd. I borrowed kit from Jenny Wordsworth. There was some kit in the army stores as well, which I was able to borrow. So I, you know, borrowed everything I could. And it's great when the polar community is quite a small one. So it's great when you have all these people who, you know, are helping you out. And I, I put messages out to people, basically, anybody that had done anything. Do you know where I could buy a fur ruff, for example? You know, <laughs> Can, can I just go to the market and get one? Do I need a specific one? So in the end, I borrowed Lewis Rudd's jacket. Jenny Wordsworth, who's also a polar explorer, um, lent me her in-reach device. These people are just so helpful. And I still haven't met Jenny Wordsworth in person. And she um, she wasn't home at the time. So she kind of packed everything up for me. And I went over to hers and her partner handed me everything. So she's been a real help as well. So it's been a mixture of people helping me with the kit side of it and self-funding training trips and then of course I have sponsors on board now as well and supporters which is a huge huge help because actually the the main expedition I would not be able to fund just through my savings and I spent them all on Greenland anyway yeah the sponsors to get people back you means a lot you know um, team army came on board a, uh, a few months ago and they have been so so helpful in helping me get supporters on board so you know it's it's really important to try and get a team together to help you there's definitely 
were times at the start for me where I was trying to do everything myself, which is just so difficult. There's so much to take into account, like the kit and equipment, trying to find supporters and sponsors and, you know, working up a contractual agreement with that sponsor as well, which I had no idea how to do as well. So, you know, if you can get people to uh, to help you in that area, then um, it's, it's great. Always really helpful. I remember emailing hundreds of um, companies and you know I'm starting on the inquiry pages of websites and a lot of companies don't get back to you some companies will get back to you and say you know not at the moment obviously COVID you know has a huge effect on it as well uh, which I completely understand and then the one company that I remember having the first pitch I was quite nervous because I've never really had to sell myself in that way you know what can I do for the company as well what benefit will they get from supporting me and I got the first company say yes and you know it was just a huge step for me I was like okay that's one on board and the last two months has been great like and I've got you know six sponsors uh, supporters on board now which is absolutely fantastic so I've got just over halfway to the funding and I you know I'm going I was like I've got these supporters on board like they are backing me I am going to the South Pole this year you know there's nothing that's going to stop me now. You're a British-born Indian, and I'd just love for you to be able to share a little bit more about maybe some of the pressures that comes with that from being Asian and wanting to pursue these adventurous challenges. Is that going against the cultural norms and the expectations of what you should be doing? And if so, you know, how do you handle that? It is definitely going against cultural norms but to be honest I've been going against them most of my life so um, a lot of the time I you know I'm labeled a rebel or it's our preach just does what she wants but I don't think not fitting that box should make you a rebel and that's that's with anything so one of the main questions I'm still asked from you know whether it's not so much my my immediate family members anymore, but extended family me- members will be, oh, Preet, when are you getting married? Because that seems to be a really important thing. And, you know, I do understand that's important to them. Um, I do understand that. But I really want to make it clear and very clear that, you know, that is not the most important thing to me. And I don't think that we should encourage, uh, you know, especially the younger generation, that that should be the most important thing. I remember an aunt uh, talking to my niece who was about six at the time and my niece has got my granddad's eyes so like beautiful blue eyes and I remember my aunt saying to her oh wow we're gonna have to find you a good looking guy uh you know when it's your turn to get married I was like that's really not the kind of thing that I would you know want to talk to my my niece about to be honest I think it's more important to encourage her to break barriers and and go out and do lots of different things I think it's really important to me that what I'm doing becomes the norm. So I don't think it should be breaking barriers. I think that going out and doing these different adventurous things can be the norm. And how incredible would that be? Again, I I think about my niece when I'm talking about it, because if she sees this as the norm, just imagine growing up without any barriers and boundaries or thinking that you have to fit into this this box imagine what you could achieve so my um my mum had an arranged marriage when she was 17 years old and when she got divorced it was a big deal and that at the time again was breaking barriers and a lot of people didn't agree with her and you know so my mum's broken those barriers and then there's me breaking different barriers so joining the army and you know doing a lot of the various different challenges I do so then hopefully my niece you know won't won't have these barriers so I would really like to encourage people from my background and and, you know not just my background but different backgrounds too anyone who feels that they have these pressures which can be difficult because a lot of the time it's coming from family members as well or it's coming from friends but there's just so much out there and I find that when education is there it helps as well so at the start nobody wanted me to join the army now you know a few years on everybody was you know really proud and when I commissioned and they came to my um my commissioning parade at Sandhurst you know they were so proud so a lot of it's education as well a lot of these things that people see as scary or out of the norm it's just something different to what you know potentially older generations know and what they're aware of so hopefully I will be part of educating people as well and in terms of 
how I manage it and how I handle it, I think I've definitely become more verbal about it. You know, I used to just shrug it off and be like, oh, you know, whatever, when people ask me. And and now, yeah, I'm more verbal about it. When people ask me, I'm like, well, you know, why are you asking me about marriage? Do you, do you know anything about my job? Do you want to know uh, about my military role? Do you want to know about this South Pole expedition that I'm planning? You know, does it matter that I I would be, you know, if I achieve my aim, I'll be the first woman of colour to do a solo expedition in Antarctica? You know, how how are those not the things that you're asking me about? How is, why is marriage the most important thing? You know, I remember my when I was younger, my mum saying to me, you know, I just want you to be happy and, and meet a nice guy again that will look after you. Because again, that, you know, that was her norm. But she's always wanted me to basically be able to have more opportunities than she's had. And I remember, um, I think there's a share quote somewhere that says uh, something about mum I am the man that you wanted me to marry and you know it's great when I was able to have that conversation with her to say actually I'm good I don't need anybody to look after me you know I am independent on my own and you know you know if I choose to get married it will be because I want to choose to get married not because of any society pressures or because I feel that I need to be looked after you're currently in training for Antarctica how is all of the physical training going like what are you focusing on are you following a training plan are you working with a personal trainer have you designed your own training plan are you doing strength and conditioning are you pulling tires you know what are you doing to get yourself in the best physical condition I am following a physical training program and I do have a coach. So this year I started training with John Fern, who has been absolutely brilliant. So he puts together my program weekly and it's a slow and gradual build up and it's a mixture of strength and conditioning and tire hauling and he'll write notes in each session too which I really like so you know if it's a certain drill why I'm doing that drill what heart rate zone I need to aim for and it just means that I don't have to think about that side of things as much so you know I feel like I'm quite busy at the moment with various different things I'm doing and with that program I can just follow that program and I trust him completely and it's it's basically a gradual build-up if you think about it I don't want to reach my peak anytime soon um so this year I'm actually the aim is to be very sensible and not do uh, sometimes I uh, used to randomly decide to uh, do an endurance challenge you know like last year I did 24 hours of step-ups um, for charity or you know various different challenges so this year I'm training smart because Yes, I've been quite impulsive in the past with different races I've done, and this is completely different. I want to do everything the way that I should be doing it, and it's very important to train smart. So I'm practicing keeping my heart rate at lower zones as I'm dragging a tyre, because you think about Antarctica, it's not a race. I need to maintain that physical and mental resilience and speed, etc. when I'm out there for, you know, about 45 days. In terms of um, other training abroad, hopefully when we are allowed to travel again, we'll um, end up doing another trip. It's difficult for me to say where at the moment because it depends when when I can get out of the country. And that will just be five to seven days basically practicing with all my kit. So getting out to Greenland was really, really useful for me uh, because if I hadn't got out there to do that training, I think it would have been a struggle to say that I'm going this year. How can people follow along with you, follow along with your journey, keep updated with your training and your progress and your future trips? Where should they go? Best place to go is um, Instagram. So um, follow me on at Polar Preet. My website is www.polarpreet.com even. Um, so you can have a look on there as well where I'll um, write some blogs, etc. Yeah, so that's where you can follow me. And um, Preet, I'd love for you to share your final words of advice for other women out there who want to have more adventure in their life, take on new challenges, but are maybe feeling, uh, maybe don't feel confident enough to go against society and go against their family and their friends. What advice would you have for those women and girls listening? I would say it doesn't matter where you're from, what your background is, or what your experience is. If you want to do something, I think believing in yourself is is the first step, really. And, and this is what I did as well. So you know, just telling myself that I'm capable of so much and the possibilities really are endless when you start believing in yourself. So just take that first step. 
I'm just so excited for you. It's going to be such an incredible adventure, such an amazing challenge. And thank you for coming on the Tough Girl podcast and sharing more about your life and your passions and your interests and your future dreams. It's been absolutely inspiring. Thank you very much. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Preet. For those of you who are brand new to the Tough Girl podcast, my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsored and ad-free and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about how you can support the Tough Girl podcast, please visit patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. All patrons will get their name on a dedicated page patrons page on the tough girl website all female patrons five dollars and above are invited to join the closed facebook group the tough girl tribe so as well as there being a monthly option there is also an annual option now and if you sign up as an annual patron you will also get a 10 percent discount just want to say a massive thank you to maria coffee julie cornelius natasha Furness, flora jones francis uh, chateline lawrence bonima rima pori rochelle brogan steffi Gipfel. Gluek. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I don't think I have. I'll try it again. Steffi Zipfel Gluek, uh, Ventiana Dam, Helen Lane, Helen Oaks, Katie Holmes, Maddie Church, Rebecca Sada, Sally Dinham, Sarah Desjonquez. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Desjonquez, D E S J O N Q U E R E S, Tiana, uh, Vivian, Vivian Alia. Laura Massey Pugh, uh, Jen Jen, and Rowena Harding. Thank you so, so much for signing up as annual patrons. It really does make a massive difference having that consistency and having that income coming in. It really allows me to invest back into the Tucker podcast and allows me to, to fund all of these running costs and help to increase the amount of female role models in the media new episode of the tough girl podcast go live every tuesday and thursday at 7 a.m uk time so make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out now if you're particularly interested in polar explorers then i've got a very exciting episode which is going to be coming out on the 20th of july we're going to be speaking to rosie stancer who is an accomplished polar athlete and explorer since 1996 she was described by one journalist as a cross between tinkerbell and the terminator it's quite an explicit episode as well because we do talk about one of the challenges that she faced on the ice was when she had to do a self amputation of a couple of her toes but it's she's a phenomenal athlete a phenomenal explorer and it's just amazing to speak to her to find out more about her mindset her resilience her training and the various expeditions that she's been on so well worth putting that date in your diary that episode is going to be coming out on the 20th of you 20th of july if you hit that subscribe button then the episodes will automatically get downloaded on whatever platform that you listen to the tough girl podcast on wherever you are whatever you are doing give it your all give it 110 percent get after it go for it believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.